new Dark Crystal show, right? <laughs> this is things. Boris. Yeah. Four. Four. Well, hi, how Hello. are you? Good, how are you? Thank you. Okay, sure. are you guys a friend? Yeah. Has, has it been coming? <laughs> has it been done? Um, I promise this is not going to be a German. <laughs> it could be. It could be. No, <laughs> I wanted to make it usable for them as well. Right. Um, so, um, Fre uh, Frederick? Oh, uh, Freddy. Freddy? Okay, Freddy. Um, as a composer who has worked in many different media, uh, TV, film, video games, um, does your, you, you have a certain process for your, your own personal process for composition. Does that change depending on the project that you are working on? And, and um, when you work with the director, the showrunner, how does that influence or how can that influence your, uh, your process? That's a really interesting question. Um, because there's certain, certain components of my job that are always the same, which is me walking in my studio and sitting at my desk and hitting my keys. But how I think about the movie and the characters is very much influenced by who I'm working with. Because directors will come in and tell me a very simple thing like, just before we do any spotting, let's talk about how I want the audience to feel when the movie ends. And it's things like this that immediately change how I'm looking at a project or a movie or a story. And uh, yeah, and sometimes it's very systematic where we go from start to finish and we discuss every character and, and where things are going and, and, and that sort of guides my way. In the Dragon Prince it's a very interesting, different aspect because they never tell me what happens next. So I'm kind of in the same seat as the audience is, which makes it, I think, it, it puts my mindset in a different place as if I would know everything. And maybe that's, an, that's a good way to go and it will keep the music innocent enough so things are not necessarily, you know, spoiled too soon from a musical perspective. Yeah. So there are, there are some exceptions to that, right? So this character yeah. in The Dragon Prince who was kind of hidden for the first, entire first season, really. True. And we discussed that character with you so that you could kind of introduce some themes around this mysterious character in the first minutes of the show, even though we don't meet him until season two. Yes, but they only gave me yeah. like <laughs> very rough details. I don't think you guys went into too okay. great detail on what's going to happen. It was just like, yeah. by the way, this guy will come back and he might be mm -hmm. That's kind of all I knew. Yeah. And I think that was probably a little... Yeah. yeah. But, but people notice that. Like, it's, yeah, it's I know. It's amazing. Right? People, people on, people on social media, right? Go back and they see it and they realize, oh my gosh, like this character, Aragos' theme is like... The it's already minute. there, like in the first minutes of the show. It's, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, Freddie, how is it? Um, because I did not realize how much it was accredited for for the DC animated film. So, how is it working on the the, the genre of superhero, especially with the really booming era of it being right now? Like, how is it with that concept? And then there's Doom that you work with, the right. movie that's there. You know, yeah, very different. Yes. Well, you know, how is it? It's that's the time of my life. <laughs> Seriously, I get to walk in my studio every day and work on cartoons. I mean, it's like, you know, what else can you really wish for? <laughs> it's, 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 that's it. So, no, it's, it's fun. I mean, I was really lucky to get into the DC line as well because they've created this whole new universe and the string of movies that kind of all connected and I was able to tap yeah. into most of them. Yeah. So it, it almost feels like another giant TV show <laughs> that's just broken up into movies, but the themes are all over the place yeah. from yeah. every movie intertwined into all these other things. So it's been fun to structure that kind of along the way. And I, again, I didn't know I would be doing this many. Yeah. So I, I may have could have done things differently if I had known this, but yeah, this is what it ended up, and it's, you know, it's super fun. It doesn't look like they're slowing down, so yeah. I, I think now you have to I know that. Think for the long run with that, right? Yeah. If Batman Hush is premiering tonight. That's right, I will be there. there I'll be there. Aaron, what about your pro oh sorry, what about your process? When you are having a new project, do you does it depend on what the project is or what the medium is when you say, okay, we know we're gonna need a soundtrack, I want I know the sound and this makes me think of this person. Or does something else step in and uh, influence that decision? And then how do you go forth? Um, you're communicating with them what you want. Um. You know, when, when Justin Richmond and I were creating the Dragon Prince, we knew we wanted it to be an extremely collaborative project. That we wanted to bring in um, other amazing filmmakers and composer to to be visionary storytellers, you know, uh, alongside us, and not just people bringing their component. Um, one of the people we were fortunate to bring on early as a showrunner was Giancarlo Volpe, who is 
amazing director and a really talented showrunner, and he had worked with Freddie on Green Lantern, and so he kind of um, spoke to kind of, I guess, Freddie's in- incredible unlimited uh, abilities to to bring emotional um, storytelling into his music, and so um, it was really about finding the right person who you believe in, and then, you know, when we talked to Freddie, we connected right away, and um, he did a, a sample of... Um, uh, for one scene that uh, legitimately made my daughter cry, which normally is a reason not to work with someone, but in this case, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was like, all right, well, there we go. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the process is, is often about finding the right people to share the vision with, who you're excited to work with as co-storytellers. That's, that's what we did. Yeah. What should be for you a good collaboration between a director and a composer? Yes. Oh, what, was your... uh, what should be for you a good collaboration between a director and a composer? Well, I, w- I would say must collaborate to, uh, to, to do a movie, for example. Well, I think there's a lot of chemistry between the yes. composers. Yes. You know, it's like, it's like what Aaron said, you just have to find people that are on the same page. So yes. You kind of say one thing, but I already know immediately what that means in the long run and throughout the whole season and okay. without having to send kind of second guess. I'm kind of now, I, I always know where these people are at with the story. Yes. They trust in me. You know, you have to think about it this way. In animation, unlike, unlike um, live action movies, okay. there's almost never or sometimes very little tempo. <laughs> Because there's no real time to do that, to spend the time to cut into music. So the editors may put in some placeholders here and there, but often it's just it's just there to kind of help the cut. And then when I come in, I more or less ignore most of it and kind of try to do my own thing. To first of all, not be derivative of anything already existing, mm-hmm. to kind of have my own personal touch to it, which I know the filmmakers appreciate as well, and hopefully make it better. Because cut music often is just kind of works, but it doesn't quite work as well. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, there's, I have a huge, there's a, there's a big field of creativity that I can search in, and, and, and it's, it's really fun to work with people where, first of all, that appreciate what I'm bringing to the table, yeah. and secondly, that make me feel comfortable to take risks. Yeah. Sometimes yes. you work with people where you, if you're always second-guessing everything you're doing because you're like, oh, they, don't, they said they don't like French horns. Oh, they, this guy's on the drum. You know, you kind of restrict yourself from all these things where people just kind of impose restrictions on you. Yeah. But in, in Dragon Ball specifically, I'm, I feel I can do... I have a cool idea that may be a little bit out there, but I'll do it. And if they say no, then that's fine. I'll do something else. But at least yes. I have the ability to try things. And often something really cool comes out of it. Thank you. Yeah, that's really, I think, having that mutual trust is key to a really good creative process. Thank you. I was just going to ask, just to double down on that, for you, Aaron, what type of confidence and creative freedom does Netflix give you in order to do your projects? <laughs> um, Netflix has created an environment that is, that is, that is there's a lot of creative freedom. We'll go with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they want the creators to bring their vision to the project. Um, and we've, we've been supported in terms of uh, telling the stories we want to tell, yeah. the way we want to tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. Something I'm always interested in, and it doesn't really matter the media, is um, a composer's use of, hopefully careful use of dissonance. Is that something um, that, when do you like to use it? How do you choose to use it in something like the Dragon Prince? And if you have any... um, um, thoughts on that, thoughts on that, or input. I'd like to know what your thoughts as the as, as one of the creators to kind of you know make sure everything fits and is in streamline and telling the tale and not detracting and not um, you know taking someone out of the story. If there's ever been an incident where you have maybe had to be convinced of something um, that that it sticks. Well, this is a tricky thing because it can be interpreted as not good sound or a mistake, even sometimes if not done right. And I think, in our case, we don't really limit ourselves to saying this is a preschool fight, we cannot use any dissonance, nothing can be creepy or horror music. Uh, we don't really have to do that. We, if something scary, we go full on scare. If something is, is uh, creepy, we can totally do that. And dissonance certainly plays a big part in that, especially 
um, you know, is, I mean, there's a lot of people in the that require, you know, I mean, mostly it's surfing and feeling. You mean literally like dissonance, like from like, like from a horror musical movie. dissonance, yeah, yes. like okay. strings making your the, the, right. the hair in your neck stand up. Yeah. And and we can we are up. We, we we've set it up so we can do that without anybody thinking it's weird out of place. And that's kind of nice to have that as part of the palette. You know, things really go weird and go weird. And our yeah. us, his theme, the, first, the, the character we talked about earlier, his theme is actually quite dissonant. It's not, the keys are not related to each other. And the scale is unusual too. So within that, you create a certain dissonance that in one, on one side creates mysteries, but also gives you this feeling of this guy's off, something is not quite right. It's just, I don't trust him. It's discomfort. It's discomfort, yeah. but, <laughs> but it's still so cohesive and melodic. So it's, it's a piece of music. But uh, I think we, yeah, we've, we've earned that. Yeah. Trust the audience to do that without yeah. being out of place. Or, <laughs> I, it never bothered you. I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think I've ever gotten a note where somebody said it's too dissonant or this sounds like a mistake. It's, yeah. it's been usually different, like story yeah. points. Yeah. Which is great. <laughs> so I've used it right. I guess. Okay. Yeah. So. So we know yes. season three has been <laughs> announced. Right. Can you give us a little bit about the direction we may be going for with that? Um, definitely an narrow question. Well, I mean, we'll be talking. We have a panel tomorrow. We'll be talking about it. Okay. Some stuff like that. Yeah, until then, hopefully. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but um, I, I personally like. Um, I'm so proud of season three. And, it's amazing. Uh, the. I think all the things we wanted to do, like I think everyone was coming to the table with all their powers, really strong. Like I don't know, it's, there are there's a moment in the middle of season three where we were we were listening to um, your initial score with my wife, and it was at night. And again, I'm telling you the story that I've been making my family cry, <laughs> and she was. Um, I'll say is uh, she's pregnant, and so she's on motherhood and things like that. And uh, after the scene, she just said she was really shaken. She was wow! Like, and it's like the, the, the season is going to be really powerful, and we're really proud of it. And, like, and when you when you hear the season, you can be blown away. It's, it's so good. I think it'll fulfill all the fans' expectations. All right. And, and yeah, anything you want, I think anything you want to see is going to be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much.